Freehold, New Jersey, 1976. It was a Sunday night, and my parents took my sister and me out to dinner. When we arrived at the restaurant, my father parked in the lot, turned off the car, and turned to the back seat. And then he said, we have something we need to tell you. Your mother and I are getting a divorce, and daddy is moving out. I had no idea what kind of impact that moment was going to have on the rest of my life. I had no idea. I had no idea that that was going to be the moment that I started to lose my father. And I had no idea that that moment was going to be the start of a very lonely childhood. As far as my parents were concerned, I understood everything that they had said that day. But I understood nothing because I was four, four years old. I had no idea what they were talking about. And in the coming days and the coming months, I saw what was happening. Lots of fighting. My father left the house. Lots of pain, lots of anger, lots of talking about one another. I saw my father every now and then. And with all the chaos, I went to the safest place I knew, which was my imagination. I retreated into my mind, which was a place that I knew nobody could touch me. You see, I didn't understand what was happening, but in my head, I could recreate what had happened in a way that maybe I could understand. So I would take the tape of my life, and I would rewind it, and then replay it. And I would look at it, and then I'd rewind it again and I'd look at it again from a different angle. Rewind it again, different angle, and I was trying to answer the puzzles of my life because I understood very little, very little. The question I was trying to ask at that moment is why did daddy leave? Is it something that I did? Because I didn't know, I had no clue. And I could look at it where I was at fault, and I could look at it as, well, my sister was probably at fault, and that's the one I went with. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, as time went on, I was telling, I was, I was rewinding tape on different parts of my life, and I was looking at it. And it was just something that I did over and over again, looking at something that had happened because I didn't get it. Looking at it from one angle, a different angle, over and over again, so that I could solve those mysteries in my own life. Over and over again, I was doing it. And they weren't about my family necessarily, they were about other things. You know, things going on at school as I got older. Why didn't the girl like me? Why didn't I have many friends? You see, I was a very withdrawn and shy child and adolescent growing up. But even though I was withdrawn and shy on the outside, what was going on on the inside was vibrant. There was a very vivid imagination going on as I told myself stories over and over again, rewinding the tape, looking at what was happening, trying to understand my life. And, you know, as I got older, the narratives got more sophisticated, actually. Um, there was buildup in these, in these narratives. Uh, there was even a soundtrack every now and then in my mind. Sometimes I would tweak it and I would turn out to be the hero because in real life I wasn't the hero. I rarely came out on top. But that's what I was doing. And it actually became a part of who I was. That's how I thought. And I looked for every opportunity after something happened to go off and think. Go off and retreat into my mind so that I could interpret and understand. You know, I didn't know then but I now know that at that early age, I enrolled myself in a master storytelling class. That's what I was doing. Master, master creative narrative construction. I'm still taking that class today because that's still how I think. I still experience things, then scurry off and, um, and replay it in my mind. Actually, one of the the TED volunteers um, saw me off to the side earlier. I was just thinking about something that had happened. It's what I do. It's how I survive. I'm still doing it. And I'll, I'll be doing it till the day I'm, I die, I'm sure. 
You know, um, I make a living in story now. I've done a lot of things in my career, but now I am in story. I'm a story professional. I tell stories and I help people to find their stories so that they could tell them in front of a, a live audience. That's what I do. But I never knew that other people were like me in that they used stories in their minds to understand the puzzles of their own life and their own connection to life. I thought I was the only one. I thought I was alone, up until recently, actually. I mean, I've been working in the story world, and I didn't know that fact. And I'll tell you how I came about this piece of information. It was August 2012, and I was running in the woods in Chapel Hill. I run in a forest called Carolina North Forest. 750 acres of trails, wide and single track, and it's my place to go to meditate, to be alone, and to run. And I should tell you that um, I always run with a hat, always, especially when I'm in the woods, because I have this irrational fear that you know, I'm going to run through a big spider web. <laughs> right, oh, I hate spiders. I mean, I run in the woods, but I'm, I fear spiders. A big spider web. And that, that spider that's inside the web is going to like land somehow in this luscious, thick head of hair of mine. <laughs> and it's going to know that it's luscious and thick and wonderful, and it's going to burrow down, lay some eggs in my scalp. <laughs> I know, it's crazy. And then two weeks later, I'm picking produce at Whole Foods, scratch my head, and then 200 baby spiders come <laughs> coming down my... I know, so I always wear a hat. I never forget it because of this fear. <laughs> so one day, in mid-August 2012, I'm running in the woods, and I actually feel that my hat is sitting up a little too high, so I, I pull it down. And 10 seconds later, I feel this on my head, and my hat's gone. Now, I should tell you that when you're running in the woods, um, you're usually looking down. Okay, because there's a lot of technical running, technical details, roots, rocks, lots of obstacles. So I just figured that I brushed my head against a, a, a branch. And so I stopped, I turned around to pick up my hat, but my hat wasn't there. Then I thought maybe the hat got caught in a, in, a, uh, in a branch. It was just sitting there. There was no branch at all. I was looking all over the place. I couldn't find that hat. I was like, what is going on? So I set up a little perimeter. I started in the center and then I, I did one of these things where I'm getting wider and wider. It was like a yellow brick road from the very beginning, you know, and I'm just going out. I'm not going anywhere without this hat. I'm going to find it. <laughs> After about seven or eight minutes, I can't find it. I've got to get out of these trails. I've got to keep running. And so I continue. But while I was running, I was so puzzled by this whole thing. Where did my hat go? And then I started to think about possibilities. Like, Maybe the hand of God came down and re <laughs> removed the hat from my head. Like, and maybe, and I, I rationalized this, like maybe like there's peril up ahead, like a, a tree was about to fall, and if I was on that original trajectory, I would have been in its path. And so divine intervention came down and saved me. But the thing is, I don't believe that. I don't believe in that type of intervention. That's not a story that I could really buy into and tell myself. I still had no idea what had happened. I know that something touched me. I know it did, but I couldn't explain it. So I got off the trail, and I was obsessed with this issue for weeks. It actually affected my sleep. I felt like, <laughs> I know, I felt like I had the beginning and the middle of a story, but not the end, and that is unsettling, especially to a storyteller, especially with somebody, especially with somebody who has spent a life in trying to understand the things that are going ar around him. Okay, so two weeks later, I'm on Facebook. I hate Facebook. I can't <laughs> stand it, but, but I'm on it every day, by the way. <laughs> so I'm scrolling down, scrolling down. I'm like, why did this person take a selfie of themselves with the duck lips? I have no idea. <laughs> Like, what's going on with the uh, Walt Whitman quote? I know you don't read Walt Whitman. I know, I know. <laughs> it's, just, it's just bonkers, that thing. So anyway, I scroll down, and I see a post from a Facebook friend of mine named Mary. She lives in Greensboro, North Carolina. The date is August 20, 26, 2012. And she writes, Last night, I was sitting in my kitchen, and I saw a really 
intense light coming through the window above the sink. I went outside to the front porch to look, and when I looked up, I saw a brilliant, bright, beaming light coming from the moon. It was the most brightest, it was the brightest light I had ever seen coming from the moon. The next morning, I woke up and found out that Neil Armstrong had died. And I believe that the moon was sending out a beacon in honor of its fallen comrade. And I read this. And I thought, are you out of your mind, Mary? <laughs> this is insane. Like, come on, is she really putting this personification on the moon? That it's like calling out, boom, bing, bing. I was, I was just like, ah, oh, just another one of these crazy, crazy posts by somebody. And then I thought, you know, I can't blame Mary for this. I can't even criticize her. She is just taking two things that doesn't make sense, that don't make sense to her. And she is telling herself a story that actually provides her with some sort of meaning and comfort. And had the two events, the hat being taken from my head and my, my inability to get over it, and, and this Facebook post not have happened in proximity to one another, I probably wouldn't have put it all together. But the thing is, is that Mary was trying to find meaning in the same way that I have always been trying to find meaning. And when I thought about that, I thought that everybody, everybody tries to find meaning in their lives. Everybody is always, uh, they're always rewinding the tape and looking, whether they realize it or not. It is the gift of being human that makes us so reflective and self-aware. It's a wonderful thing. We are constantly telling stories about our lives. We have a lot of students in the audience. You guys get a grade, and then you interpret that grade and make conclusions about your own intelligence. That's a story you tell yourself. Is it true? Is it not true? It doesn't matter. It's true to you. That is the meaning in your life. You know, many things. There's an article in the New York Times from 2005 that I recently read where a journalist followed around two one-week expeditions down the Colorado River in the uh, uh, Grand Canyon National Park in Arizona. These two expeditions traveled down the exact same part of the river, but they were inhabited, they were, they were filled with two different types of people. The first was young earth creationists who actually were going down the river looking at the rock formations and, sa and saying that this, is ma this was made by the great flood 4,500 years ago as, as depicted in Genesis. Whereas the other, um, the other group expedition going down the river a couple weeks later were filled with evolutionary biologists and geologists. And they studied those same rocks and looked at them and said, this is the result of slow and gradual change over billions of years. They saw and experienced the exact same thing, but told, each other, told themselves completely different stories about what they were seeing. That's what we do as human beings. And it, it's incredible to think that I didn't really realize that, that I have not been alone in this, in this endeavor. I mean, it seems obvious that we tell ourselves stories, but I just thought I was so wrapped up in my own reflective place that I didn't realize that we all do that. And it's a great thing that we do that, whether that's right or wrong. So, you know, stories that we tell ourselves are what connects us to the world. Telling those stories to other people is what connects us to each other. But before I get into that, I, don't, I want to let you off the hook for just a little minute. I do want to tell you what happened to my hat. <laughs> I mean, it's only fair. I led you on, and now I, you know, I need to do that. Um, I know what happened to my hat. I did some, some research, and it, found, it turns out that there are several people who have talked about their hats being stolen from them while they were running in Carolina North Forest. It was written about in the News and Observer and the Chapel Hill News. And let me just tell you, they know exactly what happened. As they were running, an owl swooped down and grabbed their hats off their heads. Now the thing is, I have no idea if an owl took, a, took, took the hat off of my head. But it is a viable story that I could tell myself. There's nothing in my story that refutes 
that claim, and there's a lot to support it. And so that's the story I tell myself, and that's the story I tell other people. I am a past scientist, a past teacher, a storyteller, and a victim of an owl attack. <laughs> so anyway, these stories connect us to the world. Telling the stories connect us to each other. I was a shy and withdrawn kid. I told you that. But when I went to college, I felt that I needed a voice. I wanted to express myself. And the only thing that I knew to give to other people were the stories that I had been telling myself. And when I started to tell these stories, people really took interest. And they took interest because they weren't stories about heroes. They were stories about vulnerability. They were stories about the underdog, about a person who's afraid of a lot of things. And through trying and staying at it, maybe I was able to persevere. I don't know. But people connect to vulnerability. People to connect to the frailty and the mistakes that people made. And I've made plenty of them in my life, and I was willing to talk about them. If somebody says, I want to tell you about a story about climbing Everest. I climbed Everest, and it was great. Nobody cares. <laughs> I mean, it's wonderful, but it doesn't connect you to that person. A well-told story that includes real vulnerability can reduce the distance between two strangers to zero. Zero. I've made many friends over the telling of a single story. So I, um, I perform shows around North Carolina. And about two years ago, I was uh, in Greensboro. And we had just finished a show. And a guy walked up to me. He uh, was probably in his mid to late 20s. He was beardy and was wearing a flannel shirt. And, and he, um, he introduced himself. He said his name is James. And he didn't want to take up much of my time, but he really wanted to, to talk to me. He said, you know, I've lived in Greensboro for a year. And um, I've been having a really rough time. Um, I've got a lot of emotional issues, a lot of anxiety. I'm depressed. Um, about six months ago, I started listening to your podcast. So I put out a podcast in which we highlight personal stories told by people in the community. He said, I, I, um, I listen to your podcast. And when I listen, sometimes I'm cooking, and I find myself laughing hysterically. And then other times, I might be doing something else, like folding laundry, and I find myself sobbing uncontrollably. You know, when I listen to those stories, I feel connected. I feel connected to other people. And when I listen to those stories, I don't feel so alone anymore. And when he said that to me, I thought of that little boy sitting in the back seat of that car all those years ago. And I looked back at him and I said, I know exactly how you feel. Thank you. <laughs>